Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh my dear brothers, sisters, friends and the foes out there and welcome to another episode of the Blood Brothers podcast with your host Didi Hussain. Before I introduce today's guest, I want to remind all the avid podcast listeners that you can find this episode on all three seasons on all the major audio platforms and if you're tuning in via YouTube, don't be cheeky, do remember to click subscribe to the Five Pillars YouTube channel. Today's esteemed guest is joining us from California. Uh, he is a scholar of Islamic theology of decolonial studies and post-colonial studies. He is one of the co-founders of the first accredited Muslim liberal arts university, Zaytuna College. He is also a professor and lecturer of Near Eastern and American studies at the University of California in Berkeley. And that's none other than Ustad Dr. Hatim Bazian. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, honored to have you on. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. How often do you visit the UK? When... Uh, not as often as I would like to, but every one, every year, sometimes once every two years, but hopefully that will be far more steadier uh, now. I'm here with actually a group of students from UC Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley, where I teach. And uh, they're actually coming here to the UK f for a course uh, to study Muslims in the West. Uh, the immigration, refugees, post-coloniality, uh, also to be introduced to the long history of British colonialism mm -hmm. and why we're here, because the British, the French, the Dutch, the Belgium were there, uh, as the debate often uh, in this country as well in the United States, why you're here. Well, uh, if you were not there f in the first place, we would not be in here. So the question actually has to be changed uh, in the debate on immigration and refugees. So how to study uh, the Muslims in the West, and not only from uh, acculturation and integration, but actually the long history of almost 500 years plus of colonial legacy. So I'm hoping to continue that type of work. And I asked you uh, in the lift coming up that whether you're a full-blooded Palestinian, and you are, right? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, again, in terms of uh, my father is uh, originally from the city of Nablus, and my mother is from the city of uh, Jerusalem. And we still have the family both in Jerusalem as well as in Nablus. So in this sense, uh, a full-blooded Palestinian, with a caveat, because Palestine is a... Uh, crossroads of civilization. Mm -hmm. uh, so we speak about Gaza. Gaza, one of the names for Gaza is Gaza Hashim, was because the great grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is buried in Gaza. And Gaza was actually a major station or a major crossroads for trade. Uh, you know, we speak about the uh, trade in Mecca. Uh, the caravan used to go up north and a caravan used to go up down south to Yemen. Uh, so those relationship in terms of uh, using full-blooded, I'm often a little bit hesitant because I understand the current uh, debates in the West about who is actually fully British or fully French, <laughs> as Marie Le Pen mm. says, you can't be French unless you're French to the source. And the last time I checked, uh, all human beings have the same blood. Yes, of course. And there is no human being that except they have 23 chromosomes from the mother, 23 chromosomes from uh, the father. The source. And so from the source, that is the only source. And from us, uh, in terms of thinking about Islamic tradition, uh, we're all created, right, from one source. And then we come into the world to be tribes and uh, nations so that we may know one another. So that's like one way both to affirm my Palestinian heritage, but at the same time always frame it uh, in a broader conversation about belonging and what does it mean for us to, to assert a Muslim understanding of world and the Muslim understanding of man and woman uh, in a global context, which I think we need to be doing today. Um, you know your Palestinian heritage and you know the years of activism and campaigning that you've done, has it ever affected or negatively impacted uh, your uh, role at the University of California, Berkeley? Has it ever brought any pressure on you? Well, uh, if we want to assert that our counterpart in terms of uh, the Zionists, the pro-Israeli, are very well organized, mm -hmm. 
uh, they have mustered their resources to target uh, and to uh, defame and demonize anyone that speaks on Palestine. And this is not new. Uh, myself being a, a primary target, we have a number of these uh, 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 websites that target individuals. We have a major uh, type of uh, effort uh, to keep the narrative only dominated by the pro-Israel narrative. And as such, uh, almost on a daily basis, sometimes on a weekly basis, I get an avalanche of hate mail. I get an avalanche sometimes of death threats. It depends on the occasion and uh, the period. And in essence, also universities, uh, while they claim to have defense of academic freedom, uh, to claim a discourse of liberal understanding, they are still reflective of the dominant aspects of the political landscape. Mm -hmm. uh, I tend to actually always say that the university is part of the reproduction of the system, uh, meaning that we graduate students that are going to fit into the reproduction of the system, whether it's in the politics, in the military-industrial complex, uh, in media discourses, mainstream media, and so on. So as such, being Palestinian, you always are uh, facing uh, an uphill battle. You're facing a climbing a mountain with a toothpick, not even a shovel or a, a tractor. And also that the river that is in Western societies and Western universities is a river that has been liquidated by colonial discourses. Uh, we should not get this illusion uh, that the university is somewhat separated from uh, the colonial legacies. And here in the UK, you know, the Oxford, the Cambridge, uh, all these institutions, uh, you had embedded intellectuals that were the thinkers the uh, uh, motivators, the writers of the empire. The justifiers, the uh, explainers. The justifiers, the explainers, and so on. The you thinkers. Know, the thinkers, all this uh, framework. Usually, the individuals that they oppose were the hot potatoes. These were the people who chased out from academia. Mm -hmm. Those who are uh, the people that were not celebrated uh, because they did not bite on, uh, you know, the... Um, the colonial imperial legacy. And that's the same uh, in the present. Uh, and many of us, at least, who are critiquing uh, academia in general, m the major academic associations have been completely silent on what is taking place in Gaza. People would think otherwise because you we're seeing all these student encampments, we're seeing that some universities have decided to uh, divest. Uh, so. You're on the one hand saying that actually the institutions to the core are actually embedded or synonymous to the imperial system or the colonial system. Would you then say that even things like decolonial de studies is done within a certain controlled environment? Well, let's put it this way. There is decolonial studies and there is institutional decolonial studies. Okay. The institutional decolonial studies have been silent on Palestine. <laughs> Okay. Silent on the genocide in Gaza. I guess they're worried about their next uh, contract for another book of nothingness, mm. speaking about nothingness and contemplating nothingness. So there is an institutional, right, uh, if you want to say mainstream decolonial studies, uh, and it actually possibly is marked by whiteness okay. in this sense. So in this sense, there is a deep critique of what uh, has been this aspect of uh, institutional decolonial studies. On the other hand, there are a number of scholars that are, in essence, traversing the inside academia and outside articulation of decolonial studies, and I put myself in that category. And as such, the mainstream institutional decolonial studies, uh, main institutions, academic institutions, and associations have completely been silent on the questions of genocide and Palestine. Why do you think that is? Well, because they are, in essence, upwardly mobile. Uh, they're thinking, uh, if I speak on Palestine, I'm not going to get the new book deal. 
Okay. And therefore, I am going to be uh, what you call uh, uh, pushed or marginalized. I might not be invited uh, to this next book festival that's going to celebrate my book, which only a few people read, right, because I speak and write in ways that are not really connected to the struggles of people. Uh, there's also in academia a uh, considerable pipeline of grants, and therefore the grant making and the grant uh, allocation is one way where the uh, doors and the keys are kept. So people who are, in essence, work the system, they don't want to say anything because the grants are not going to come because those who are part of these massive uh, grant-making institutions uh, take the road of least resistance. Uh, also, some of these are uh, individuals who want to move up on the ladder. So the person who's an associate professor wants to be a full professor, full professor wants to be a chair of the department, chair of department wants to be vice president. Sounds vice president. very colonial. Oh, it's absolutely, it's a <laughs> colonial. Again, the university is the custodians of the epistemic of the society. So for the most part, these are individuals that know the game and they calibrate where they, their status. And increasingly also we have what you call Muslims who play that role, right? The good Muslim, bad Muslim of, of our dear Professor uh, Hamid Dabaji who wrote about uh, Mamadani, not Hamid Dabaji, that wrote about the good Muslim, bad Muslim, which has been a way to frame uh, the engagement of Muslim po post 9-11. So all of this is part of this dynamic that we see. Uh, another element is that you have many human rights centers right, in universities, in here in the UK and in the United States, complete silence on uh, genocide in Gaza. As have been many women's rights groups and feminists. Uh, women's, uh, uh, for me in Berkeley, we have a strong environmental movement in California and so In the on. UK, they've been very quiet. Generally. Very the, quiet, yep. right? Uh, if, a, if a tree is uh, what you call harmed or about to be cut, you'll have a massive mobilization. So, again, if we assume that the Palestinians are these human trees, and literally you have close to 21,000 seedlings, which is kids and babies and children, if you just think of them as trees, you would have said something. Right? Exactly. So literally complete silence on the human rights front, complete silence on the women's rights, white women's rights uh, movement, the feminist movement, uh, complete si silence of the environmentalist movement, complete silence of the literally the custodians of international law. And that's, on the one hand, uh, we can recognize that this is colonial legacy uh, coming into center stage, but on the other, it also gives us the opportunity to actually do a deep dive and critique uh, what I consider to be not only post-World War II system, mm -hmm. but I think we could actually put forth almost a 500-year-plus uh, of the critique of this Western exceptionalism, uh, this Western trajectory of quote-unquote quote, civilization, uh, this articulation of the new human, and I think that's where we need to be in relations to our critique and also provide what is our alternative view and vision in terms of where the world as a world system is at. Ustad, so since you differentiate between institutional decolonialism and then decolonialism in terms of the, the permeation of it, how it manifests, where do student encampments fit into that? Well, I think the students encampment, uh, one, it's responding to utter silence of the institutions. Right? So, uh, let's just work out a little bit back. Uh, Columbia University, right? they had a student encampment. Uh, the university attempted to uh, try to target students. Uh, some of the major Zionists, including an attack on the students of form of chemical uh, um, uh, weapon attack or a chemical substance that were thrown on the students, mm -hmm. demonization, taunting, violence from uh, the Zionists on campus. Uh, so Minur Shafiq goes to the Congress. They call, uh, before that, they call Harvard, MIT, and uh, uh, Penn State, and so on. So. Uh, Minush Shafir goes to uh, Congress to testify. And from a, uh, an institutional colonial frame, she did great. 
uh, she sat there taking questions. She threw our uh, dear professor uh, Joseph Masad under the bus. Uh, she threw the students under the bus. She did great, right? From a institutional colonial frame, right? she would be celebrated. Mm -hmm. right? Now, to know that Minouche comes from the World Bank, so she's not coming what you call from uh, you know, Liverpool uh, or the anti-apartheid movement. Yeah. She's coming from the womb of post-colonial, post-World War II system of control. So she came back empowered that Congress and her performance uh, have met all of the right check boxes. And she was told that if she cracked down on the students more and she was just clean up, right, this notion of cleaning up the campus to make it safe for the articulation of Zionist point of view and Israel point of view, she would be actually celebrated. Again, she did all the boxes. She calls on the New York Police Department. They come, beat up the students, yep. uh, take them out of the building. So it's literally from a top bottom, institutional colonialism, she did all the right thing. In 48 hours, students across the country responded by putting encampments. Yep. And the students actually, in terms of their response, they responded to the institutional colonial discourse and immediately began to question their own universities. Now, universities have big buckets of investments. So some of these universities are in the uh, you know, multi-billion dollar, 50 billion or more. And then you also have to add to it the retirement funds of uh, the uh, staff, the faculty that are there. So the students immediately began to critique the university on the one hand, but also the United States government, the Western world. And as such, they created a new alternative sites for decolonization and critiquing uh, where we are at right now. And I think that has caused it to spread. Uh, literally, I was traveling to visit Columbia University, uh, Penn State, and others. And my flight to uh, the East Coast, while I was flying, by the time I landed, 30 new universities had added encampment. And then in here, the UK, I know there is about 36 there universities. About 36, yeah and throughout the world. So I would place the students as a response to the institutional colonial decolonial framing because the university has perfected the notion of working around diversity, which I call it symbolic, using diversity as a symbolic capital to maintain the status quo. Mm -hmm. So I would place that the students are, in essence, a response and they're beginning to challenge the scope of what the university uh, complicity, both in the military industrial combat, but also in the long history of colonial legacy, uh, long history of military industrial complex, long history of uh, some of the most draconian aspects of our society. And this is going back to the slave era and also moving forward to the contemporary period. In the short term, what have they achieved? And on the long term, what do you think they're seeking to achieve, these student encampments? Mainly in the US, but by broadly speaking in the, in the UK. So we understand that they want the universities to, to divest, stop investing in Israeli Zionist um, uh, projects and vice versa, receiving funds. But other than that, for our viewers and listeners, what else is it? Well, uh, I do think the best comparison to say that uh, political mobilization is a process rather than an end in itself. And if I want to point to uh, the success, I'll compare the current movement to the period of the anti-apartheid struggle. Okay. All right. Uh, in the sense, the anti-apartheid struggle mobilization, uh, the university students at the time played a major role, especially after uh, uh, the uh, killing and the murder of uh, Stephen Biko. Right, with the consciousness movement, uh, university students began to intensify their organizing. And I would say that we are facing a comparative right, in relations to uh, South Africa. Uh, what the students accomplished, I think one, they reframed the debate. Right? Because the debate was Israel has the right to defend itself, uh, that we are uh, almost, the universities were putting out, uh, I 
we've been collecting all of or most of the statements of major university presidents and major university administrators on what they said post October 7th. So the university itself, the political elite were on that side. So one, they reshaped and rechanged the topography of the discussions and the debate that now centering Palestine and Palestinians. How that will take place, again, we will see. Second, it began, it, they transformed the site of learning and education, right? Uh, so much so that uh, using both platforms like this, social media and others, that they've been able to capture and transform what is counted as education, so much so that we are actually on almost each of the encampment, they have a library. And many of these encampments had actually a whole series of lectures, sometimes from morning to the evening. Yep. I visited a number of these, also gave lectures. And so, so it actually transformed the university uh, by creating alternative site of knowledge production. And I compare this to the uh, emergence of the whole field of ethnic studies. At right? UC Berkeley happens to be the place where the field of ethnic studies was born. And the first classes in ethnic studies, meaning black studies, Latino studies, Native American studies, Asian American studies, the first courses were actually out there on the plaza. Uh, when the students had their, uh, both the free speech movement, then led into the anti-Vietnam War movement, that they began to teach courses about the history that is not included. Mm -hmm. And that now gave birth to the whole field of ethnic studies across not only the United States, but also on a global level, including here uh, in the UK. So I do think that there is this knowledge production that is successful and has been actually been able to create the space. I've been actually telling students and in my talk that they need to demand the creation of Palestine studies uh, in the universities and to make sure that they have a Palestinian professors that are hired to actually be able to teach Palestine on its own uh, foundation. Does it exist anywhere, Palestine studies? There mm. is not a single, there is a Palestine uh, uh, academic workshop in Brown University. Uh, there is a, uh, not a full program, but a, uh, a Palestine center in Columbia University. Uh, there is attempting here or there. So this would be one way to actually give birth to the field of Palestine studies. Are there studies on Zionism in Israel? Uh, it's often actually uh, put under the... Uh, Middle Eastern studies. Mid not un under Jewish studies, but at UC Berkeley and other UCs, they actually have been including uh, Jewish and Israeli studies, so much so that even at UC Berkeley, as a result of... Uh, uh, some uh, Zionist professors protesting that the, the chancellor, president of the university, literally uh, said, we're going to create an Israeli studies program. This was not the case in relations to Palestine. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that we take the moment of this uh, uh, knowledge production taking place in the encampment to transform it into academic programs and to transform it into students. The third part, which I think is very important, is that students began to put uh, forward divestment resolutions and uh, uh, vote among student population. So we had a number of universities, not student council, which is a smaller group, but actually a referendum or a, a whole student body. And so far, all these are passing with overwhelming two-third majority plus including at Stanford University with somewhere between 74% voting, uh, Bernard College in Colombia at 81%, uh, which means that the public sentiment high numbers. among the student population has been completely transformed. The, third, the fourth element is that the in internal university work of students and activists has also impacted externally. And we have a number of cities that actually passed a divestment resolutions, which is very significant. Uh, the first city in the United States was Richmond, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Hayward, uh, Hayward uh, City Council and so on. So I think we're beginning to see the impact of the activism that's taken place. And that's what I would say that the uh, pro-Israel, the ADL, APAC and so on are going overboard to try to silence the debate because they're seeing that they actually are losing 
the public debate, the, the university, that they're no longer Israel as a, um, as if you want to say, as a, as a product or as mm -hmm. a public relation entity is no longer defensible. So that's how I assess where the university is at in relations to uh, the South Africa. Uh, remind people that South Africa, it took almost, uh, and again, uh, Nelson Mandela goes to jail in 64, right? Uh, the first real uh, uh, boycott uh, and success of the uh, boycott effort does not register until the 87, 88. Uh, so I think we need to think on those modalities of what is occurring both at the college campuses and the mobilization around Palestine. Let's move away a bit away from students and universities and let's talk broadly speaking about who are seen and considered as the friends and allies of the Palestinian cause, right? And we'll see over the years, historically speaking, it has been those who either identify as socialists or on the left. We've seen this in a very, in a very physical and financial uh, way during the Cold War period. Uh, we saw the relationship of the PLO and various factions with mm. left-leaning groups and so forth. But they come in many stripes and colours. People of faith, no faith, Christians, Jews, atheists, and some from even from the LGBTQ community, mm -hmm. right? And what we've seen since October the 7th is a mainstreaming of the Palestinian calls. Uh, we saw in Glastonbury Festival, mm -hmm. yeah. the, the largest music festival in the UK, seas of Palestine flags. Uh, we've seen, uh, you know, in San Francisco, one of the seen as considered one of the capitals of the LGBTQ movement, mm -hmm. laws of Palestine flags, right? Or at least people who from that lifestyle, from that uh, leaning, are also pro Palestine. We've seen famous uh, superstars and celebrities talking about Palestine, but also at the same breath, you know, the, their lifestyles and their outward uh, aesthetics is something that would be perhaps antithetical sure. uh, to, to Islam or Muslims anyway. Who are the gatekeepers of the Palestinian cause? Who are the allies? I mean, I mean, gatekeepers is one thing, allies is one thing. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about allies. Is allies generally a broad term that applies to anyone who is willing to be a friend of the Palis Palestinian cause? Well, the term allies, and again, we have to differentiate between principled allies and allies that are just jumping on the van wagon for their own particular purposes and efforts. In similar way, again, because I was active during the anti-apartheid movement, at a certain point when the cause become larger than the cause itself, that it brings a big umbrella of changing and beginning to challenge certain elements within the uh, mainstream political, economic, social, cultural norms. So I think Palestine have entered what I define as a tipping point. The tipping point presents that Palestine becomes the avenue in the same way, I would say, by 88, uh, 89, the anti-apartheid movement reached the tipping point. And at that point, it begins to be this any uh, organization that did not take a position on the apartheid uh, regime and very clear position, it was seen to be outside of the big umbrella of political mobilization. And mm -hmm. I think we have reached that moment in here. This time around. This time around. So I, again, uh, I said this way back in November. Uh, and part of it that it was measured, uh, even uh, uh, within the first three months, they looked at uh, social media imprint. Uh, on the Israel side, the estimate of social media share imprint was in the 500 million plus. On the pro-Palestine side, it was close to 25 billion imprints. Wow. Okay. Meaning, and it's not, it's not these are not all Palestinians, mm -hmm. but actually it's a broad spectrum where people actually accumulatively said there's something fundamentally wrong. Mm -hmm. Now let me just take a little, back, a little bit back. I do think that the Palestine cause has benefited from the Ferguson protests and from the George Floyd uh, murder. Not benefited meaning seeking. 
the Ferguson, there was an alliance that emerged between Black Lives Matter at that point and the Palestinians because they were actually engaging in social media communication about how to confront tear gas in Ferguson, uh, that these uh, Ferguson police was being trained by the Israeli mm -hmm. uh, security services, and that struck relations. As a result of the Ferguson, a big delegation or delegation from the activists, black activists in the United States, visits Palestine to engage with the Palestinians. So that begins to be a formative type of organizing. Now, moving to the George Floyd moment, George Floyd opens the political debates on the history of racism, the history of enslavement, the history of colonialism in ways that were unimaginable, unimaginable before that. And that coalesces the relationship on Palestine, Palestinians. If you remember, this is just post-Trump and the Muslim ban, all right? So that creates a larger umbrella that I would see we're seeing its results right now. In here, in the UK, you had people that were trying to take down the statues, mm -hmm. change names of buildings. Some of our students who were actually uh, 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 studied with us in South Africa, they were taken similarly, taken down the statues. So the George Floyd actually moved the ideas that were impossible to be impossible and to being actualized. So you're saying they opened the space for what we're seeing now? Well, they opened the epistemological space because okay. if you can't think it, you can't actualize it. In here, it was being thought of, right? It was being actualized and it's being actually opened the debate. So still till now, we're changing names of buildings, statues are being removed, uh, different programs are being there. So we are in the middle of this you could say it's messy, but it's a messiness that is born out of the discourses around uh, uh, the murder of George Floyd because that was, uh, if you want to say, a, an iconoclastic moment in the history, not only for America, but in global history because that was 8 minutes 49 seconds mm -hmm. of an iconoclastic collapse of this notion of that uh, this is the height of civilization, right? America says it's exceptionalism, it's all these notions. The, that video, the outcome of it is an iconoclastic moment. It collapsed in people's mind, this exceptionalism, and as such, we build on it. So when you are evaluating Palestine in the current moment, you have to put those contexts in there. And I would draw it back almost to 30 plus years because the pro-Israel organizations groups, they were wrong sides of history in the apartheid movement. They actually stayed with apartheid till the last day. They were actually on the wrong side of history when we talked about Central Latin American solidarity movement. They were wrong side of history in attacking Black Lives Matter and so on. So that's what you are seeing in this tipping moment. Now moving to the second part. Gatekeepers. Okay, the gatekeepers. I would say the moment today what we have is the lack of gatekeepers in the broader sense. The movement is totally decentralized. Is it wrong of Muslims to feel that they are the gatekeepers? I, I would say it's wrong for them because they're not really gatekeepers. They're late, late comers to the Palestine cause. Muslims? Muslims, yes. Are you saying this generally or in an American context? Uh, I would say generally in terms on an official organizational capacity. Again, I've been... Uh, engaged in Palestine for all my life. Just to give you, uh, if we evaluate from post 9-11, right, it was very, very difficult to speak on Palestine in Muslim space, whether in Europe or in the United States, in Canada, and including in the Muslim world. You could speak about anything. You could speak about wudu, you could speak about tahara, you could speak about the finer points of what you call divine love. You could do rumi, you could do anything, but don't talk about Palestine in a very systematic, structured way. Uh, were there outlying voices? Yes. But structurally, the Muslims were completely, post 9-11, it's just, please don't speak about Palestine. 
In the United States specifically. Yeah, because I was thinking, isn't, that's not been entirely the case in the UK because Palestine fell under a host of other topics uh, like jihad or sharia or khilafah, uh, Palestine. I know, but um, I differentiate between rhetorical appeal for Palestine mm-hmm. versus systematic and actually structured work on Palestine. Cool. So Muslims were actually late in coming, right? in relations to Palestine. Should they be the gatekeepers? Uh, I don't know. They have to qualify. To be a gatekeeper, you have to qualify to be a gatekeeper. What is a gatekeeper? Uh, and a gatekeeper is a key understanding what are the requirements of the moment. Not to be caught in seeing yourself in the mirror and thinking that you're beautiful and therefore that's, right? There's a lot of what you call self-reflections that often we, def- we confuse our attempt, in essence, to center ourselves with actually being gatekeeper right or what i consider to be is a custodian rather than a gatekeeper so what does it mean to be a custodian yeah right uh, i come from a tradition that uh amir al qawmi khadimuhum that the uh, uh commander or prince or the overseer of uh, people is their servant we have transformed this to uh al qawm khadimu amirihim <laughs> Right? The people serve the... The people serve those who are in their leader. And that's very problematic. Epistemologically, it also has to be challenged. So that's what I'm saying that in relations to how Muslims began to think about Palestine, uh, they moved from complete uh, structural uh, 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 pushing out and excluding Palestine to wanting to be the superheroes of Palestine in a very short period of time. And I would say what we need is to tamper and recenter ourselves in order to understand both the history and what are the requirements for us to be uh, custodians in the full sense of what the Palestine struggle needs, both at this point and moving forward. We're talking about a struggle that is 100 years old. Uh, So I also, you know, uh, Palestine was not colonized in 1948. Palestine was colonized 1918, December 10th, December 11th, 1917. And here's the aspect. The majority of the troops that came with Great Britain, and alhamdulillah is no longer great, right? Uh, The troops, the majority of the troops were Muslim troops. From India. From India and Egypt. Because the main troops that actually came out of Egypt and so on. So even when we think about the history of 1917 and what happened, we have to also speak about the the Great Arab Revolt. The Great Arab Revolt of Sharif Hussein was not great, nor was it Arab. It's T.E. Lawrence of 10 Downing Street, an intelligence officer from Egypt, that came with the idea of uh, instigating a rebellion against the Ottoman mm-hmm. by promising Sharif Hussein to be the Khalifa. Khalifa yeah. right? So we need to go to d- down the street and say, you know, Antum Ahl al-Hal wal Aqd, <laughs> you're the people who not and not, we need you to appoint a Khalifa for us mm-hmm. because you already promised Sharif Hussein. And literally... They got the desert of Jordan and Iraq. That's what they got, actually. Uh, well, I, I, the British got the Jordan and Iraq mm-hmm. against the best against the uh, movements that were in our Iraq and Jordan, mm-hmm. right? So uh, Faisal was appointed to be king by the British on Iraq, that completely torpedoed the nationalist uh, political organizing that was taking place in Iraq, and we still see what is occurring. And then similarly in Jordan, so custodian relationship has been literally absent and today we're speaking about talking about the muslim world right uh uh the muslim world has been completely not completely with a few exceptions silent on this i talk about governments and regimes uh, government and regimes but also where are the incumbents in uh universe in, in arab and muslim universities where are the uh, boycotts some would counter to that sheikh is that Many of them are living under despotic regimes. You know what what students in the West can get away with, you can't. In how Egypt, about boycotts in Bangladesh and Pakistan. You're getting but, jailed. You're getting kidnapped. Yeah, but how about boycotts? Your own financial means in your pocket. That's your own decision. Where they, is it? They would say this is on our statesmen. Our regimes and our governments choose to sell arms and deal and recognize it's not right even. In. It's like in the most common what you call, uh, you know, products. Uh, the uh, Muslim market the, the, has the, been... The Starbucks, the McDonald's, that stuff, is that what you're talking that's about? That's one aspect, yes. But again, the boycott, divestment and sanction movement 
has not actually registered in the Arab and Muslim world. And therefore, we still massively, massively uh, engaged in uh, expenditures with economies and with governments that are uh, not having the best interests of the Palestinians. Again, I separate between rhetorical, emotional appeal to Palestine versus structural work for actually Palestine. And that's why I'm always hesitant to make claims that cannot be substantiated. As you know, most of the supplies for Israel right now are coming through the United Arab Emirates, passing through Saudi mm -hmm. Arabia, Jordan, and to the bridge to supply Israel. And these are three major states. Right. Uh, Would you put Turkey into that equation as well? What is it? Would you put Turkey into Turkey that equation? Turkey, actually, it's, it's, uh, uh, trade with Israel was about $7 billion. Mm -hmm. And it's just literally continued unabated. You could talk about the supplies of oil and gas from Azerbaijan that is coming uh, to supply Israel. So we're not speaking about Palestine being attacked by Israel and Zionism. Palestinians are facing Zionism and Israel are facing the Western powers, the United States, uh, Britain, France, Germany, Netherlands, and so on, but they're also facing the power of the Arab and Muslim world, right? Whether it's the Egyptians closing the borders on Palestinians in Gaza. Jordani Jordanians. Uh, Jordanians, which has the longest border. Uh, you have trade that is taking place from Gulf countries. You have trades from other Muslim countries. You have uh, uh, just yesterday, yesterday, before yesterday, the Spanish prohibited a military ship, Israeli military ship, with supplies police. to dock in their ports. So it actually goes and docks in Morocco. Now, Morocco has a long history of relationship with Israel. It dates back in the late 50s. The, uh, the late King Hassan of Morocco was facing a major political opposition in, uh, in Morocco with a movement that wanted you know, democratic, they wanted a change. So uh, the Mossad uh, assisted and helped uh, King Hassan uh, to neutralize uh, the opposition, including targeted assassination of Moroccan activists in Europe. Many wouldn't know this. And in return, mm -hmm. uh, the Moroccan uh, king uh, facilitated the Mossad to operate in, uh, in uh, uh, Morocco, which ended up a quid pro quo, uh, facilitating the migration under the protection of the king and Israel of almost a million Moroccan Jewish uh, immigrant uh, to Israel, to, to Israel mm -hmm. while also allowing the Mossad to bug and to uh, set up uh, surveillance of the Arab League summit that was being held in, in Morocco. Now, just to give you the kicker for it, uh, Morocco, Moroccan uh, king and government are the custodian of the Jerusalem Committee of the Arab League. Wow. Uh, so you can't, <laughs> the, the problem is again, the, the structure is what makes it possible. When we say that Palestinians are not, are left alone, literally they're left alone when we speak about 57 Muslim majority states that for the most part have not been able or willing, because you have to have the political will, have not been able or willing to actually challenge in any meaningful way uh, the power and the dynamics of both Israel and the alliances that makes the Palestinians face uh, almost a world system that is intending on their erasure. Hold up, the show will continue. But before it does, I want to remind you all that the Blood Brothers podcast is the fastest growing English language Muslim podcast in the world. When we deliver unique quality content to you week after week, brothers and sisters and friends, it requires money. So please click the link in the description and support this project however you can. Back to the show. How does decolonialism look like in the Muslim majority world? Like, if you look at from the breadth of, of the Muslim majority world, from Morocco all the way to Indonesia, as north as the Caucasus to the south as Tanzania, the vast majority are dealing with corrupt, despotic regimes, many of whom are in the pockets <coughs> of one of the global superpowers, most likely America, but there's also China and Russia in the scene now. Mm -hmm. What does decolonialism look like there? It has serious outcomes, well, serious uh, implications. I, I do think what we need to understand, there isn't a single center in the Muslim world and even in some parts of the global south with some few exceptions that have 
actually taken decoloniality in a serious way. Possibly, I would say the Latin was, America was Arab Spring decolonialism. Uh, well, Arab Spring was a moment that possibly would have uh, uh, resulted in a decolonial, but I do think that they have lost their their way by trying to appeal to the West to see that we could be civilized like you or we want to implement market uh, economy and, and em em embrace neoliberalism. But also the counter-revolution was very swift and literally did, there's no country that have faced the Arab Spring except right now is like in the depth of the muddiness of mm. the counter-revolutions. Sure. Right? So that's what uh, we are having. So A missed the, opportunity? It's a definitely a missed opportunity, but trusting the military in the post-Arab uh, Spring, uh, they just did not really take account of the depth of colonial, post-colonial structures. So we moved from colonization to the post-colonial system. So we're still in the post-colonial era. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, very important for us to understand. These are post-colonial states. What does post-colonial states look like? The, the educational system is colonial, right? So you rarefy and uh, you give uh, a high articulation of Eurocentricity. Uh, so all of our educational systems in the Muslim world are Eurocentric, right? With minor exceptions here and there. Even we attempt to articulate our Islamic understanding by saying, Islam and democracy, Islam and this, because that's the measure of uh, comparatives, mm -hmm. and that's what the standard is. Right. So education system is colonial. The economy is colonial. It has not been uh, what you call dealing. Uh, one way to measure is actually all uh, the uh, Muslim, Arab, uh, colonial, post-colonial states, their primary trade partners are their ex-colonial motherland. Absolutely. There is no inter-trade, like some countries are almost in the 90th percentile. And we know anybody that knows the economy, you have to create synergy by engaging both internal trade and trade around you. Absolutely. That has not happened and continue to be the case. Uh, the political social order, right, is all colonial. Right? The same paradigm that was actually agreed upon extracting the Western troops Right, French, British, Belgium, and so on have been replaced by local troops trained by the ex-colonial motherland. Right? And then religious discourse likewise replicate this colonial, right? We're still trying to say that we could be modern, right? Muslim uh, religious discourse from 18th, 19th to 20th century is still trying to say, oh, uh, we are in decline, right? Because, again, the Orientalists said you're in decline, and therefore you went into a therapy session for the past 300 years to say, oh, poor me, I am in decline, and look, you know, we have to go to Bernard Lewis and so on and so to tell us why we're declining. So that has been the notions uh, in there. So do we have uh, ways for us to articulate decoloniality? I think those are where some of the heavy lifting, both of ideas and structures and programs to actually counter this. Uh, from post-World War II until the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, we were in post-coloniality in a, uh, uh, in a, uh, a, a, a Cold War system where the United States and uh, the Soviet Union were at odds. The Muslim world, for the most part, had its own co uh, what you call a Cold War yeah. between the monarch monarchists and the nationalists. And, uh, yes. And within that, also Muslims were duped to articulate their Islam in relationship to the West using some of the Quranic texts, <laughs> using this relationship because the Russians were on God, uh, they don't believe in God, and the West yep. believes in God, so they aligned themselves yep. with the colonial right uh, history in here. And also that the Russians were also having their own colonialism if, beginning with the takeover of the uh, Asian states during the Ottoman Central 17th, Asian states, right? So, yep. so in this sense, Muslims did not have, did not articulate their own vision, but rather began to articulate their Islam in relations to the dominant powers that are there. And they went out to what you call to the pastures with this, uh, articulating Islam in accordance to what they see uh, 
uh, there aligns that is much better to align with this and that's we're still in that period as we speak is u.s hegemony in the muslim majority world where as you rightly and so succinctly articulated that the economic grip the political grip the fact of the mat- matter that pre-modern empires those days have gone you don't need tens of thousands of soldiers to be stationed in a particular land to occupy it or really you just have your guy there and you sustain the system through funding through grants imf loans world bank and corporations all kinds of stuff is u.s hegemony where there is still u.s military bases across the gulf in turkey and elsewhere is u.s hegemony good for the muslim majority world if your answer is no sheikh how does an american muslim patriot reconcile that with that i ask you this because mm. the flavor of patriotism amongst our cousins across the atlantic it's a bit different to that of their cousins here in the uk and um, i'm not saying that british mm. muslim patriots don't exist they do but it's <coughs> certainly more amplified and more visible amongst our american cousins across the pond how does one reconcile with the fact that us hegemony if you have the position that us hegemony military hegemony economic hegemony is bad for the muslim world but at the same time i regard myself to be an american patriot how do you reconcile that well you could reconcile uh, american military and economic hegemony as it's been articulated not only is bad for the world but it's also bad for americans themselves why would americans want not want a strong and powerful america well let's put it this way uh the u.s military budget right now uh which was just approved recently 869 billion wow okay this is more uh wealth and money than the next 20 countries combined in their military expenditures so people I would actually refer you back to one of the last speeches of Martin Luther King was the three evils of society. And he says that we need to uh struggle against the three evils of society. He says militarism, materialism and racism. All right? And six months later he was assassinated. <laughs> All right? Today what Martin Luther King said in that speech in 1967 have been multiplied by almost 10 million in terms of ratio. Wow. Right? So what you have today is a society in America where you have a small elite, very small, right? That has dominated the political, the economic the underpinning of the society at the expense of the overwhelming majority in America just the absurdity is we gave Israel 40 billion where Israelis have free health care free education while Americans can't actually and don't have access to health care right so in this sense you could still assert a particular defense of the society you are in while not accepting the political arrangement and structures of how that society is to be actually governed and articulated. Uh Eisenhower says that he fears from the halls of power the power of the military industrial complex. We are in a military industrial complex uh economy that have already have overtaken from long time ago not today even before Vietnam have taken over the halls of power. we have reached into a death economy we produce death machines we have uh, last year i think the total arms sales around the world is close to 2 trillion dollars the united states have 56% of the sales of weapons and death machines around the world most likely in any conflict around the world the bullet that is being used the bomb that is being exploded in gaza or in the congo or in sudan has made in the united states at it right so the understanding of this has to be a critique of both where we are at today and how to articulate a different future and different world i do think that the american public for the most part poor middle class and so on have been given a rotten deal by the political elite they'll tell them that we need to put a a base in the outland areas of africa to protect you 
That has nothing to do with the protection of America. It has to do with the protecting of corporations, military industrial complex. We have transformed right, the uh, preamble, all men slash women are created equal, to all corporations, all military industrial complex corporations are created equal, endowed by their creator with the right to extract resources and kill as many people as possible in order to enrich ourselves. So that's for me how you could articulate and come at, and it's not all, it's nothing new. It's been a critique of Malcolm X. It's been a critique of Martin Luther King. It's been a critique present in U.S. intellectual discourses for quite some time. So you don't fall into the only way to articulate defense of society is actually by jumping on an F-16 and say, you know, I declare myself as a Muslim committed to, uh, you know, patriotism in America. And there are some of our brothers and sisters in America. That's how they feel that the only way for you to articulate being in the society is actually by biting on this notion of military industrial complex or materialist success and added to it also racism. So they understand America as being a white society, even though that um, Huntington does not see them as such. So they associate being American as actually embracing whiteness. So they all aspire to being, you know, uh, a shining hill, a shining white hill. Uh, you know, being invited to the White House, tawaf in the White House is more important than a tawaf on the Black House, which is actually epistemologically is very interesting that the Kaaba as a focal be, point be verse, right? So those are how I would respond to understanding both where America is and not to fall into this demarcation that is created. So you personally wouldn't regard it as unpatriotic for an American-born Muslim, or for a British-born Muslim for that matter, to want a decline in this type of hegemony that we've described? Uh, uh, the hegemony has been disastrous to the United States public in general. It's been disastrous economically. It's been disastrous of non-ending wars. It's been disastrous where actually we are giving dictators and uh, uh, governments that do not have the best interests of their own society, let alone the American society. But the alternative is Russia and China. That is what the counter argument I've heard well, is, what, is, is. Would you prefer a world ruled by America or Pax Americana? Or do you prefer a world of where the Uyghurs are in detention camps? And we saw what Russia did. I'm just saying that's one of the counters. You well, hear. again, uh, this what you call puts you in a box that either you are with us or against us type of framework. That's Bush's framework. That's been a framework for quite some time. Why can it be actually we think a different world? Why is it a multipolar world, right, which is something? Why is it that we can think of alternative ways where moving from a unipolar world or thinking about its uh, re-articulations of the Cold War, again, we need to think that many people who are saying this thing are literally articulating Huntington Clash of Civilization argument. I don't blame them, they haven't read, but maybe they should read The Clash of Civilization. Huntington, at the end of the Cold War, writing a piece in Foreign, uh, foreign Affairs, he says that we're moving into a clash of civilization where the focal point of this clash will become uh, the two major cultural uh, hubs, uh, China and uh, the Muslims. Yep. Right? And he actually, in essence, because they associate Russia of literally being Western, yes, there is a difference in terms of communism and capitalism, but that's their articulation. And that's where you could see some of the right wing in Europe or the right wing in the United States are appealing to actually bring in Russia because Absolutely. they see Russia as the counterbalance to the emergence of Muslims. And that also goes into historical memory yep. because they associate the defeat of the Muslim Ottoman in the battles in uh, Vienna and so on yep. with the arrival of the Eastern troops yep. that po helped. The, the Polish, the uh, Russians, Russian. the Slavs. That's what Stephen Bannon writes about. And that's where the appeal of Russia, because they think of Russia as an Eastern Orthodox, the Latin Orthodox Church that could be brought into this conversation. So people need to be aware, not only of the arguments that are being put, but where are these arguments are emerging in order to actually say, we prefer the <clears throat> continued right, uh, 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 imperial, colonial hegemony of the West, right, because you might actually be uh, uh, bitten by the Chinese dragon or, or the Russian bear, it's much better for you to be with us. Really? You're talking about 500 years plus of pillaging, right? Uh, again, leave the Muslim world aside. 
Africa has been pillaged north, south, east, west, and continued to be pillaged. Now the United States have developed a central command in Africa, which did not exist prior to 9-11, under the dubious claim of actually trying to fight the war on terrorism. Africa is still the richest continent in the world. Hands down. Hands down. Hands down. Uh, I know you, you know, you like chocolate. Mm. All the chocolate, at least 60% of it comes from, from Africa. Uh, West, uh, West Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, people in the West can't get married without the diamonds that are coming from Africa. You can't actually have uh, now some of the major uh, uh, lithium uh, mines are in Africa. So you talk about every mm. aspect of commodity, gold, <coughs> right? The French would not be in the way they are without the 14 francophone country zone. So Macron goes yep. up and try to be Mufti Macron telling yes. Muslims you have a problem yeah. while knows that the French economy would not be where it is without the pillaging of Africa. So in this sense, they're actually the person who's saying you need to fear Russia and China, and I'm not arguing for either because again, they have their own history, saying it's much better to stay with us because we're civilized and we believe in God. Which God? Mm. Right? Is the God that is actually pillaging in Africa, the God that have pillaged in the Western uh, Hemisphere, the God that have uh, eliminated it. So there has to be what you call a critique of the statement, right? evaluate the Western world on its own ground, rather than create this aspect of argument, and therefore you actually make people because we already have what you call created this fear of the Chinese and Russians in our mind because there's so much historical discourse and we begin to actually not evaluate Western history on its own ground. So let's take Belgium, right? And King Leopold yeah, and the Congo. And the Congo. Let's evaluate that. Let's evaluate... Uh, uh, he killed more than Hitler, I believe, in, in, in the Congo. What is it? King Leopold killed more people uh, than, than 50 Hitler. 50% of the yeah. population. Let's evaluate uh, the uh, British with uh, Winston yeah. Churchill. I saw the statue of Winston Churchill the in the famine. Uh, the, uh, famine in India. Mm. Right? Three million at least. Uh, three million at least. And then before that, uh, the famine in the late 1860s and so on. Millions of people. Let's evaluate that history. And not, I'm not also forgetting the evaluation of the long history in Ireland in relation to the British. Take the French in Algeria. Between wow. in 132 years of colonial occupation, some but as far as 5 million or more, including testing nuclear weapons in the desert of Algeria and not actually sharing up till today the information where those nuclear tests were conducted by the French. Talk about the Western Hemisphere, right? Uh, the genocide of the indigenous population. And I know there's a touchy issue, the enslavement, right? 15 million that are possibly recorded. Uh, some actually say more. Uh, the Middle Passage, and that went on for 250 plus years. Right? So again, if you are speaking about the fear of Russia, China, one is evaluate the Western world, and then I argue we need to rethink the world in ways that would make a different world possible. You don't have to be, the only way is either you're with us or against us. Either you accept Western exceptionalism, Right? Or you are going to be with China and Russia in that way. Why cannot be that we actually think a different world is possible? Where are Brazil? Where is Argentina? Where is Africa as a, as a continent? I know that we're dealing with post-colonial states mm -hmm. where most of these are educated by the Western uh, colonial motherlands and sent back to manage the plantation or manage the uh, franchise. So we need to think. And I, then I'm not even dealing with the Muslim world because there's still what you could have to go through 12 step program to recognize that they're actually in a post-colonial structure. Yeah. Bringing the podcast to a close, the language that you have utilized today <clears throat> in describing the situation of the Palestinian movement, the Muslim world, uh, the critics would say that, you know, the Palestinian cause, the encampments, some of the things that you've described there, the geopolitics, this is the language of pulse modern neo-Marxists who want to mm. just bring down 
the Western civilization. These are actually enemies and fifth columns within. Mm. You know, there's all this talk of whiteness and you know white blaming and you know um, you know bringing that you know divesting and bringing an end to U.S. hegemony and Western hegemony. These guys are actually plants within to bring our society down. Mm. What would your thoughts be on that? Well, it depends who is speaking, right? If it's a consort of the king and consort of the president, then that's their view because they have had it good. Well, and what uh, about the average American or average Brit? I think the average things? American, the average Brit, uh, is just basically they have no health care. Their educational system is literally collapsing in front of their eyes. There's more homelessness in the street that you possibly find in some of the uh, post-colonial states. Uh, the social fragmentation is very clear. The gap between the have and have-nots uh, have expanded. So we no longer haves and have-nots. We have the haves and the have-nothing at all. Right? So that is very clear. Mm -hmm. And more important, they're being asked to invest more in military industrial complex adventures abroad. So I would say that the argument that a critique of the status quo the same argument that is today were the same arguments that were actually were thrown at Mount Martin Luther King. Mm. Just to give you a sense, because I do teach MLK speeches in a very way. When MLK gave his speech, this is after they gave him the Nobel uh, Peace Prize, after the uh, I Have a Dream speech. This is again 67. Two thirds of the American public were against MLK. All of the major newspapers wrote editorial against him. Even the black mainstream press, right, wrote editorials against MLK, saying that he's making life difficult for us. And the last protest that he was planning for was actually a, uh, a march and a rally for poverty. Right? So the same arguments that have been used at the time in relations to uh, at the height of the Vietnam War, because he broke with the president of the Vietnam War and began to well, say, you guys are attempting to undermine the society. Yes. And this undermine society assumes that the military industrial complex, the corporations that are there, and the elite that has time and time again robbed the pockets of the people uh, clean, right? are the custodians of the society, therefore you have to actually maintain it. Otherwise you are being defamed, uh, marginalized, or uh, um, uh, uh, called all kinds of names, rather than actually in there. What I also aware is that religious discourse also tends to actually reflect. I tend to differentiate between imperial religious discourse versus the religious discourse of the common folks. So you will have what you call, which Fanon have actually articulated in Wretched of the Earth, you know, these sermonizers that come out basically to tell you to be silent or to accept that uh, obedience to uh, the, those who are in power because they know better. That for me is the imperial discourse of religion. My final question, I'm glad you actually took it there. Brothers and sisters and friends, I see that you're enjoying the content. How come you've not clicked subscribe to the Five Pillars YouTube channel? And if you're watching via Rumble, how come you've not subscribed on our Rumble channel? If you like the content, you like the guests, you like what we're talking about, it's absolutely inexcusable and cheeky for you not to click subscribe. Thank you and Jazakallah khair. This is my last question to you, Stad. What do you do or what should the response be for the Muslims when it comes to when we get a religious class of mashaykh and ulama and du'at who use perhaps interfaith, the treatment of Muslims to um, dhimmis, uh, you know, the shared heritage of the Abrahamic faith, to normalize Zionism and normalize relationships with Israel, to kind of downplay the occupation and actually strengthen the global US military industrial complex. Um, you know, th this is not about naming names or, or pointing fingers, but there is, mm -hmm. there is, it exists. Sometimes you can get variations of it existing within your own communities and organizations. How do we deal with this type of argumentation which uses those said religious arguments and rhetoric into faith? The Yahud are Ahl al-Kitab and, you know, the, you know, the Dhimmis and, you know, Abrahamic shared heritage and all this kind of stuff. How do you deal with that? Because that also falls in line with obeying the rulers. Do not boycott unless the ruler says so. 
Um, do not yeah. do, do you know? Do not criticize a ruler regarding these issues. It's way beyond your paycheck. It's a whole spectrum. And I know it's unjust to pin this on you with only a yeah. couple of minutes to go. But just some thoughts on that. Well, again, what we need to understand is this normalization pattern and a discourse vested in power and coloniality is not in you. The colonial powers use religion and religious figures in the articulation of their colonial discourse. And whether it's in India, in Egypt, and other places, even Napoleon, when he ran into uh, uh, difficulty in his campaign in south of Cary, south of Permits, what did he do? He wanted to have a gathering with the Shiuch of yes. Azhar. Yes. And he spoke to them in interfaith argument. And some say that he pretended or attempted to be a Muslim. Mm -hmm. right? And he s literally used the good Muslim, bad Muslim. And he says, I came to liberate Islam from the yokes of the, uh, uh, the uh, Ottomans and so on. So he used that discourse. And some Muslim, you know, in the time, ah, you know, fell for, it. Uh, uh, fell for it, right? Or at least began to give it credence. Mm -hmm. Now, Edward Said wrote that the, he originated the whole discourse of Orientalism from that time because Napoleon brought with him a whole in scientific enterprise, you know, uh, philologists, historians, and so on, to document Egypt. So he was engaged. The good thing today is we have uh, Napoleon's uh, meeting with his officers before this gathering, and we have his statements to, oh, the statements were actually coming from the public relations side. Mm -hmm. I compared Napoleon's arguments and discussions with the Muslims when, when Obama visited Cairo, and he spoke almost in identical terms. The only shift is the type of words that are used. So the notion of trying to engage in interfaith dialogue and so on, this is interfaith work for silencing rather i have been using interfaith work for justice we have no uh, actually we encourage people who are coming from their faith tradition to stand for justice all right what a better call right right uh, than to say we are standing collectively for justice during the anti-apartheid movement we had religious figures that were actually standing up and speaking against uh the uh, all the patterns of normalization. But on the other hand, we had religious figures that wanted to continue relationship with South Africa at the time. So there is much of that discourse. The second, there are many uh, elements of the Muslim institutions that are really, these are state functioneers. Their religious discourse is a state discourse and we need to understand this aspect of it and not to actually collapse the state articulation of religious discourse with religious discourse per se as itself. So I, that's what I differentiate between what I consider to be imperial religion, imperial theology versus religion and uh, religious discourse of the regular people and so on. So we need to be very clear in that. The notion that you cannot boycott without the authority of the, of the state or the ruler, I can't find in the tradition any notions to say that this would be a position that would be actually acceptable. I come from a tradition that is a spoken tradition. The Quran is Qara, that which is read, recited out loud for people to listen. Hadith is that which is spoken, converse, and so on. So how did we transform two spoken sources of our tradition into a silencing tradition? That's beyond me. Any concluding advice on Mashaikh and ulama, uh, people who may find themselves in situations where they disagree with whether it's their teachers, their students, their colleagues, their peers. Any concluding nasiha on those uh, people of knowledge in, in positions of influence who may differ with their contemporaries on these issues? What's the best way to manage and handle this when you differ quite seriously on, on certain issues? Well, again, difference is part of our tradition. Right? Even though when we talk about fiqh, which is the legal tradition, it's a collection of differences of opinion. And some of the even issues that are so critical, we'll have eight, nine, ten different positions. Right? In politics, the differences are wide. So we need to understand that differences right, have to be grounded in understanding what is the ma'alat. What is the overarching outcomes or objectives that we're trying to achieve? And also to separate between the tactical and the strategic. So sometimes we might differ deeply on tacticals, 
but not differ in the strategic outcome. And that requires some wisdom to understand. Lastly, is not every difference have to be publicly articulated. There are some differences, not because the difference is not real, substantive, and substantial, is that the difference in public might lead to other aspects of conflict, people who do not have, I don't like the don't have, but that actually it becomes that the scope of difference will lead to consequences that actually harm our strategic rather than harm our tactical. So I advise people to actually think deeply and be individuals that think tactically, strategically, and long-term. Palestine, for me, has been around as a struggle for 100 years. And we need every hand, every mind, every tongue, every eye, every possible capacity for us to transform ourselves from where we find ourselves today to the future, and I do think it will help both Palestinians and the Muslim world. I have a deep, Inshallah. deep epistemological commitment to seeing the Muslim world in a transformative way. Inshallah. I don't have all the answers, but I am ready to put my lot, my shy, and my coffee with everyone in order for us to get to that place where we actually have a transformative era for the Muslim world, because I do think we have all the capacities to be a difference among and with the world. And I think that's where uh, my contribution and where I want to be moving forward. Inshallah, may we live to see that time. Uh, may we, may, Inshallah. Our may our contributions be accepted. Inshallah. Inshallah. I mean. Inshallah. So, Hatim, it was an absolute pleasure having you on. I know we're a bit short of time today, but I hope I can bring you back on to Inshallah. perhaps expand on many of the things we spoke about today. Inshallah. Jazakallah khairan. Barakallah fikum. Brothers, sisters and friends, I hope you all enjoyed today's podcast as much as I did. If you liked this episode, do remember to click subscribe to the Five Pillars YouTube channel. And of course, you can find all three seasons on all the major audio platforms. And until next time, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.